Amen. Well, I feel a little bit better than I did yesterday. I tell you, I'm getting, I think I'm getting old. I must be getting old, older at least. Say it like that. Amen. Anyhow, we, uh, we wanted to come and be with you and got to come. Uh, yesterday, man, the preaching was so powerful. I, I had a couple of preachers call me and said, how, how was it? I said, well, it was just unbelievable. I thought they preached great. I thought both of them preached right to me, I thought. But it was just good. And uh, I'll I tell you what, don't believe GPSs. Don't believe them. They lie. I'm telling you, I was, uh, uh, we just got done preaching a, a camp meeting in Maine, and they said, well, come on over here and preach a, a night or two. You still got plenty of time. It's only 14 hours. Uh, or 15 hours, they said, and GPS said 14 and a half. Another guy said, I don't care what GPS says, it's 20 hours. And I said, well, this guy said it's only 14 or 15. GPS said 14 or 15. So anyhow, we headed down here, and I'm telling you, I don't want nobody to lose faith in me, at least till after I'm done preaching, but I was moving fast, and it was 19 and a half hours of driving straight wow. we got up about uh, I didn't get in bed at 1230 that day uh, at night and got up about 4 and started and got here at 1 in the morning and I told my wife she said uh, man she said you're tired aren't you I said well I'm seeing 2 or 3 uh, lanes instead of 1 yeah. and she said I know you're and you're in all 3 of them <laughs> so but <laughs> It was, uh, whoo, it was, oh, mercy. It was, uh, it was rough. But I am, I am glad to be here, and I love your pastor, and, and he, he preached for us not long ago, and boy, it was just unbelievable how great. So, and Brother Charles Barnett, what a, what a man. I'm telling you, praise God. Well, I'm going to attempt to preach a little bit here today, and uh, if you want to, Read with us. Let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 13, and uh, try not. I'll try not to get real long here uh, this morning. And this is real, real simple. Just real, real simple. And but I, I've had it on my heart for a couple of days, so try to preach a little bit about this. Matthew 13 and verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him. Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. But whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. One more verse. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear the things which you hear and have not heard them. I want to I want to read uh, part of verse thirteen and part of verse sixteen, and then preach from there if God will help me here this morning. Verse thirteen says, "Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not." And then verse sixteen said, "But blessed are your eyes, for they see, 
And that's what I want to preach about if the Lord help me today. And I, I'm going to use for a, a, a thought or a text, ever what you want to call it, here this morning. I just want to preach and ask you the question, how do you see it? That's all. I just, I just want to ask you, how do you see it? I do believe that, uh, and I'll say this to start, I believe the direction of our lives are somewhat determined by what kind of vision we have. You know, and it, it's the way you're looking is most of the time the way you'll wind up. Amen. The way you're seeing things. And I, I, I know folks uh, can look at the same thing and see it two or three different ways. Even some of the uh, writers of the New Testament done that. You know, there's two, sometimes it'd be in two gospels, sometimes three. They'd see the same thing, tell about the same thing, but there'd be a little bit of difference there. But when it comes to a lot of scriptures, sometimes we see folks that see things so much, so much different. But it doesn't change a book. Can you say amen? It don't change. It don't really matter how you see it, to tell you the truth. I had someone come to me not long ago and, uh, and use this term. Might be why it's been on my heart the last couple of weeks. But they came to me and said, uh, Brother Miller, I know you preach that, but I just can't see it. I cannot see it. I had one lady, and uh, she came to me and was talking to me about a scripture. And, and hey, I don't want to—I don't want to get too bold here. I want to be a help, not a hindrance. But she came to me, and she didn't like uh, the way I believe First Corinthians 11. And she said, "I don't see it like that. I'll never see it like that, no matter what you say, because the Bible don't say that." And I said, "Well, how long have you got?" And she said, I got along as you need. So we just stood there, had a nice, good conversation. Nobody was yelling, nobody raising their voice. And I read it to her and I showed it to her. I said, to me, it's so simple, it's so easy to understand. I mean, my goodness. I mean, I can't understand why anybody can't see that. But I remember what she said. She said, I don't care what you say. And here's the kicker. She said, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do it anyway. So I said, all right. You know, if that's the way you see it, okay. It's the way you see it. Amen. So, but that don't change my mind not one bit. Not one bit. It's all how you perceive things, how you're looking at things. Amen. So today, you know, you can come in here and I, I, I say this. Uh, you can come in here today and leave and say, well, uh, it wasn't a big crowd. It wasn't full. Somebody, uh, somebody else say, boy, we had a big crowd. You know, it didn't change the crowd, same crowd, but somebody sees it not. You know, somebody might go off and say, how'd the service go? Well, I, I don't know. Not too good. Another guy said, man, what a service. It's all how you're looking at it. When I left, I had three or four different preachers yesterday call me up and say, how did Brother Barnett preach? I said, I believe the older that guy gets, the greater he preaches. I've never heard him preach any better in my life. Than he did yesterday. Amen. You know, it's how you're looking at the thing. I'm going to take just a minute here, and I'm going to try to preach. But over in, uh, as far back, way back, I'm just going to say this quick. I'm not going to elaborate on it. I'm not going to try to uh, talk about it. Just to give you a little, little insight. If you go back to Genesis 3, when the Lord told Adam, told Eve, I'll put you in this beautiful garden. You can have anything you want except this one tree. Don't touch it. And the devil come by and he started talking to her. The serpent uh, talked to Eve and said, Didn't God say, Hath God not said, God tell you don't do this? And she said, Oh, no, that's not really what he said. He said, We could eat everything except that one. We can't eat of that. And he said, Well, you, I know he told you you'd die, verse 4. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. He said, You'll not surely die. And God said the day you eat it, you'll die. The reason was their eyes would be open. And then he goes on in verse 6 and said, But the woman saw that the tree was good. You know what? I think she, she just looked the wrong way. God said don't, but she seen it as something okay to do. So it's up to you. Brother Webb may stand up here and preach to you, Don't go there. Don't say that. Don't do this. Don't live like that. And you can find a way around it and say it, 
Looks good to me. I don't see anything wrong with it. It looks good to me. You go right ahead and do it. Amen. She went ahead and done it, and you know what happened to her. She got driven away from a, a beautiful place that she could have lived in, got driven away. Just to give you a little uh, little history there. Just one more, and I'll try to preach. Over in, uh, over in the 13th chapter, when we get in a little farther into the book of Genesis there, there was a guy by the name of Lot, another guy by the name of Abram. And they started out together. You know the story. Everybody knows the story. Nothing new here today. But as they started out together, there became a little strife between them. Have you ever seen folks start out together and things really get to going good and then strife comes? Why is that? Isn't that sad? Can somebody say that's sad? It is. I've watched churches do good and they'll grow and they'll boom and they'll get big. And then somebody else will say, well, I think it looks better over here. Grass looks greener over there. I think it looks better. And they'll divide. And that's what happened. And he said, you, you just look. You, you go, uh, Abram told Lot, you can take either side you want. You can go either way you want. And the Bible said he lifted up his eyes. And I'll preach in a minute here. I'm going to preach to you on how do you see it, how are you looking at it. He looked up and he saw there was well-watered plains, I, I, no doubt beautiful grassy fields, and he thought, that's the way I want to go. But if he could have just looked a little bit farther, he would have seen verse 13, and where it said, but the men of that city were wicked sinners before the Lord exceedingly. He didn't look far enough. All he seen was the well-watered plains. All he seen was those beautiful grassy fields. I want to tell you something today. If you're here today and you look out the world and say, I'm serving God, I can't do this, I can't do that, and I'm restricted here or there, but boy, if I just go to that church, I'd be allowed to do whatever I want. I could go there and I could really do things, and you can, but you might lose what you had, or you will lose what you had. Amen. Oh, man, he had the wrong... He, had the, he was looking the wrong direction. He was looking the wrong direction. i got to give you one more negative before I try to hit some positives here. If I can. One more here. I don't know. Does anybody here believe in paying tithes? If you do, now just don't be ashamed. Hold your hand up real high. Put them both up if you believe it. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. I, I had someone tell me all a month or two ago, you don't want to get me started on this subject. Matter of fact, uh, a while back, they had a pastor appreciation for me last fall. And when they did, they got all the young kids. They was going to make collage. They was making little papers. So they asked each one, write down the thing that you know or that you remember the most about Brother Miller. One of them, and then another question was, what's the one sermon that he likes the best? And about more than half of them put down tithing. And I hardly ever preach on tithing. But when I do, there ain't no mistake how I believe it. Praise God. Not that often, but boy, I, I believe it when I preach. Woo. Amen. I recently had somebody tell me, though, said, you know, I just don't see it like that. I don't see tithing like that. You know, some people give, some people tithe, and I don't believe in putting a percentage on it. That's what they told me. I don't think you can put a percentage on it. Well, my answer to them was, well, next April 15th or 17th, whenever it is, why don't you just tell the government I, I gave, but I just didn't feel like putting a percentage on it. Well, you fell in this tax bracket. Yeah, I know, but I, I don't want my right hand to know what my left hand does. So because of that, I didn't want to put a percentage on it. Amen. I've done this. I done. Are you all still out there? I should have preached on the Holy Ghost or shouting or something got you going here. Amen. I just want to know. You know, you can see it like this and say, man, that pastor's got more than I got. Drives a better car than I do. Got nicer shoes. I'm not going to do that. Church looks good. My house don't look this good. As the church says, we can look at things like that. Amen. But I don't think you should because according to the Word of God, whether you see it or not, it's still right. Let, let, let me go here. In the first chapter of the book of Malachi, and I've got to hurry and get through these so I can get on some good stuff. But in the first chapter, do you know really the book of Malachi is really just a series of complaints? You don't believe me? Read it. That's what it is. It's a series of complaints. 
And in verse 7, he said, You have polluted my altar by uh, polluted bread, put polluted bread on my altar. And they said, Where do we do that? And he said, The table of the Lord is contemptible. He said, Because you offer blind for sacrifice, is that not evil? You know what? God wants a tithe, not a tenth. God wants your best, not what your leftovers are. Somebody holler, Amen. I wish you preachers at least, if nobody else is going to say amen, you need to be hollering amen. So I preach on tithing at my church. I'm up almost doing, doing the cheers. Praise God. Hallelujah. He said, you, he said, and you offer the lame, you offer the sick. Is that not evil? He said, now offer it to your governor and see if he be pleased with you, you or accept your person. Offer it to the governor. Offer to the government and see what they say. No, sir, brother, there is a specific amount. And whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter how you see it or not. It doesn't matter. Then he goes along and said, there's some of you that would shut the doors, verse 10, for not. He said, you don't kinder fire on the altar. And he said, I have no pleasure in you. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. I'm going to give an offering. God said, I don't want your offering. Amen. If you're not going to tithe and you're not going to bring the good and the best and the first, I won't even accept your offering. Come on. Somebody holler amen. Amen. How do you see it? I'll tell you how I see it. I see it like the Bible says it. Praise God. Now, I know you may be saying, I wish he'd get that good stuff he promised. Well, I'll read you verse 13 in chapter 1. He said, you say, behold what a weariness it is. You know, when a preacher preaches on tithing, we can all, all read that verse right there. That's what they think when you preach. Now, get your Bible and see if it don't say that. He said, he's talking about tithing, and they say, oh, behold, what a weariness is. This guy's killing me up there. That guy's up there right, preaching on tithes again, talking about giving again. He said, you say what a weariness it is, and you snuffed at it. Amen. That's what he said. I I got a guy, uh, he passed away, uh, but when he was alive, he had a little thing he'd done all the time. If he didn't like what you said, he'd go, throw his hands up. You, anything, his name was Darren, and he would, he'd just go, Pff. i tell you what, I think that's what some folks want to do when you're preaching on tithing. Phew, there he goes. He's killing me. What a weariness it is. That's worrying me to death. It should not worry you. You ought to be thrilled for the opportunity to give. Somebody say amen. And he said, you brought that which was torn. You brought that which is lame. You brought that which is sick. You brought an offering. Should I accept that? At, at, should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? Well, you could say, I don't see it like that. Then if you don't, you could take the next verse or a couple other times it says it. And you can receive the curse. That's what he said, not me. Amen. I'll tell you today, it doesn't matter how you see it, but if you could just see tithing as a privilege, if you could see it as an opportunity, I believe, you know what I taught? I, I teach my church this heavily. I taught my children this. I don't know, a lot of you may know Doug Cornett, Missy. Missy's my daughter. And when she got her first little job, I pounded tithing in their heads. She got her first little job at a greeting card store. She wasn't making much money. She couldn't wait to get that first check. And when she did, I told her, I said, now, Missy, you know what you got to do first, don't you? She said, yes, sir, Daddy. I got to pay my tithes. I think she was 17, something like that. That's almost, that's 28 years ago. So anyhow, she said, I said, how much is your tithes? She said, I know exactly how much it is, 50%. I said, no, it's only 10%. She said, are you kidding me? I only owe 10%. That's it. She said, I can't wait to get my check. She was so thrilled. That's all it was. Really, it's all God's anyway. Do you know that? Come on, somebody holler amen out there. I'll tell you what, I preach this because I love them. I want them to be blessed. I'm going to hurry here, but I got a grandson. I got several, actually, but I got one. He's uh, almost 19. He got out of high school and got him a little job, and he wanted to get him a car, and he's smarter than a lot of folks. He wanted to pay it off cash. 
So he worked every hour over time he could. He worked 60 hours a week and done everything he could. And he told me, so I got enough money to buy me a little car. I said, good. I, w- I couldn't even fit in it, I don't think. It's one of the little Kia things. But anyhow, he likes it. I don't know how he gets in. He's six foot three, 220. But anyhow, he said, uh, I- I'm going to buy me a car. So I got up, and we need our parking lot done. And I told him, I said, we need $50,000 next week. So I'd like everyone that could give me a thousand dollars piece. If you ain't got it, okay. But I want it to be above your tithing. Boy, it's getting quiet in here. So I said, like, I hope I'm all right. I said, we need to get this parking lot done. And so anyway, anyway, my, my little grandson come up to me. Actually, I had four grandsons come up to me and done that. But he came to me and he said, Pat Paul, he said, uh, I'm saving this for my car. And, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. Part of me said, well, how could you do that, man? He's trying so hard. He's working so hard trying to get a car. Part of me said, take it and then give him the money back. That's what I thought, you know, get personally back. But I thought, no, man, I've taught him that all my life. So he gave, he brought me $1,000 bills, gave them to me. And he, he said, I feel so good about this. Camp meeting was coming up, so... You know, we had a lot of preachers come in and was trying to help as many as we could, pay their motel rooms and stuff. And so he told me, he said, how much would it cost to pay for their motel room? I said, $500. He said, well, here, I'll pay for that. I said, what about your car? He said, that's all right. He said, I'm going to do that. So he'd done that. And then after that, he'd had about, I think he had 9000 or something like that to buy this little car, and they wanted ten. Anyhow, he went in, he's down to dollars he went in and he said, hey, i like to have that car. He don't know how to negotiate, but he done good. And they said, well, we'll take 95 He said, I done gave a bunch of money to the church. I only got $7,500. i will give you that. And they said, we, we can't take $75. we will take 85 He said, I'll give you 75 And finally they told him, so, okay, we'll take 75 So he drove in. He got testified. He was excited. He took off running around the church. He got up and excited. He said, you know what? Said so God told me to do something. Didn't tell what it was. He said, and the devil told me if I did, I wouldn't get my car. He said, but I done it and God gave me the car. And he said, it's in the parking lot. Paid off. I'll tell you what, folks would just see it different. He could have looked at that and said, he told me, he said, when I look at that car, I don't see a gray Kia. I look at that car, I see lots of overtime. And that's what he told me. And I'm telling you today, if we could just see it different. Amen. Brother Webb said, we need this. You shouldn't say, I need that. You ought to say, all right, I'll give it. And watch God bless you. Oh, I wish I could. I feel this. If I'd have had something else, I'd have given you something better. Amen. How do you see it? Are you going to say you're wearing me, you're killing me? Are you going to snuff at it? Are you going to complain about it? Are you going to quarrel about it? Now, if I start talking about tithing and all the miracles I've seen, we'd be here till tonight. So I can't do that. I know that. But I tell you, I've watched it work. I've seen it work. I know it works firsthanded. I believe it. Uh, I remember uh, I remember a young man in our church. Many years ago, I was going to preach a camp meeting in South Georgia 20-some years ago. And there's a young man in our church told me, he said, I would really love to go to that camp meeting, but I can't get off work. Now, please, don't, don't nobody do this. I'm telling you what I told him. Don't do this. I'll get in trouble. And I said, well, how much you make that job? I knew he didn't make nothing. He said, $5 an hour. That's minimum wage. I said, 5 bucks an hour? Quit that job. Go to camp meeting. Quit it. Amen. Now, I know I got you mad now, but anyway... I said, you can get that anywhere. Well, I kind of meant it, but I didn't really mean it. So he called me up, Brother Barnett, and he said, when we're leaving. I said, well, you can't go. you got to work. He said, you told me to quit, so I quit. I was like, oh, my God. So I went by and picked him up. Him and his wife, they was this young couple, they went. Went to that camp meeting, and the whole time I said, boy, I hope I didn't tell you wrong. Man, I feel bad. I said, I, I, I felt bad. But anyhow, anyway, 
Yeah, he came back home. He got him another job. And he got better at the job. And he started invested in the job. And then he started taking schooling concerning that job. And now, now the guy... The guy hires many, many, many people all over the country to work for him. And I can't say how much he's worth because it's a, a whole lot. And I'm telling you, I'm just saying put God first. Watch God take care of you. Amen. If I, if you, if I wasn't live streaming and afraid of that tape, I'd, I'd tell you. It's just unbelievable. I'm telling you, I know. I've watched God firsthand. I've watched what he does. Don't say it worries me. Don't try to find a loophole. Don't say I don't understand it. Don't say anything. Just say, yeah, the Bible said it. I believe it. If my pastor believes it, look, if your pastor's a devil, leave the church. But if he's a good godly man, he's preaching to you, get with a program. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How do you see things? I tell you what, I'm not going to take the devil's word over God's word like he did. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna look at and think the grass is greener. None of those things. I want to see things different. I want to be like Isaiah was. I want to be like him when he said, when Uzziah died that year, that he said, "I saw the Lord. He seen him." And I ask you, how you see the Lord? Do you see the Lord small, weak, and feeble? Do you see him not able to heal, not able to save, not able to deliver, or do you see him great and powerful, and high and lifted up? That's how I choose to see him. It's up to you how you view it. And it will matter on how you wind up in your life, how you look at things. Amen. You can be a pessimist or you can be an optimist. It's up to you. You can see we can both look at something and you can say no hope. And I'm going to choose to say there's still hope. Amen. No way out. I'm going to say God can do it. Hallelujah. He said I saw him high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And it goes without saying, you all know the story. Every preachers preach that about the train when they overcome a king and they cut it off and put it on. And but all I want to say is this, it filled that temple. You know why? He conquered every king, every kingdom. No one could stand against him. I see him like that still today. In 2018, I think the church is doing good. I don't see the wholeness church as struggling or failing. I see the wholeness church as doing good. I see it as the greatest church, the most powerful church. I would take this group of people, this group of men over anybody. Hallelujah. After he saw the Lord like that, he said in verse number 5 of Isaiah 6, after he saw the Lord, he said, boy, I'm undone. Amen. Woe is me. He saw his, he saw how bad a shape he was in, but he saw how great God was. It was after he seen the Lord that he said, then he made the statement, Lord, when he said, who will go for us? He said, I'll go. Here, my Lord, send me. You know why folks are not willing to go? They haven't seen him yet. They see him the wrong way. Brother Webb was talking about missing church to cut the grass because they're looking at the grass instead of looking at Jesus. Amen. They're looking at they're looking at everything else instead of looking at Jesus. Thank God. I am so glad that I'm in the church this morning. I'm glad I'm saved this morning. I'm glad I still see Jesus as great. Hallelujah. Amen. Why do you speak? He said, Lord, why are you talking parables? You know what? He talked, why are you talking in parables, Lord? He said, because, amen, they see, but they don't see. Oh, yeah, I can say, look at that, and you say, I see it, but do you really see? But then he said, and this is my text, blessed be your eyes. And I want to tell you this morning, if you can see Jesus this morning, and you can see the good in people, and you can see the word of God for what it says, I just want to say, blessed be your eyes. Hallelujah. Get your eyes off the world. Get your eyes off of sin. Get your eyes off your problems. Amen. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Amen. Get your eyes off all that other stuff. Praise God. Don't look at the grass greener on the other side. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me hurry here. Amen. Hebrews. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews here. This is so good. I, or anyway, I like it. Chapter 2. I'm not the scholar you are. 
or Brother Sucraft is on that book that you was talking about yesterday. Amen. But I like what he said here. Verse 8 of that second chapter. Now, he'd been talking about being careful that we don't slip in the first, first verse. But in verse 8, he comes along and said he put all things under subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things under subjection under him, he left nothing that is not under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. He said we might not yet see everything put under him. But someday shortly we will see everything put under him. Amen. So the, when I look at it right now, I see him over everything right now. Even though he said it's not yet. To me, it's already. Praise God. Hallelujah. How in the world do you think Moses made it and endured? The Bible said he endured as seeing him who was invisible. In other words, he saw what wasn't there. Praise God. He saw it wasn't there, but he saw it. He knew victory was there. He knew his hope was there. He knew he could make it through Jesus. And he endured seeing what he couldn't really see. Why in the world did we have to prove it to me? Show it to me. I want to see. And you know, we'll fight over one. If there's one little, what we think is one little word that's not completely, when it's really explained itself anyway, we try to find a loophole. You know it's the truth. You just ain't looking at it right. You know what we need? We need some folks to get some spiritual glasses or get their eyes in on with eye salve. Hallelujah. I told him the other day when I was 40, I used to have eyes so good, man, I could spot things seem like forever away. And I got 40 years old, and I told Diane, I said, honey, I'm going blind, short as the world. Can't see nothing. I drive down the road, and I see a road sign. I had no idea what it said, and I was right on top of it. So I went to the eye doctor. I went in. He said, what's the problem? I said, I believe I'm going blind. I either got glaucoma or something's wrong with me bad. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 40. He said, what's wrong with you? You're 40. I said, what do you mean? He said, here, read this. I read it. I read it. He turned that little thing around. He said, what do you see? I didn't see hardly nothing. What do you see now? I see a little better. What do you see now? I see a little better. How about now? I said, oh, I see everything perfect. He said, all you need to do is just get, let me get you these things. He whoo, I, Brother Charles, I think that's you on second pew, ain't it? Hey, that's him. I see him good now. Hallelujah. Get them glasses on. You can see. You know what? That's kind of the way it is. Some of us are just out of focus. We're out of focus. The preacher preaches. Amen. We read the word. And it's just, it looks, it looks glory to us. But I'll tell you what, if you just get back in focus, get tuned in with the scripture, get tuned in with the word of God. Amen. Stay close by your pastor's side. Let me tell you what, first time I went over there, first time I went over there to Hawaii to preach. I, I, I really I really got kind of aggravated. I ain't going to lie to you. I mean, buddy, you if you turn around, you're going to bump into somebody. Now, if they get this, you all know I love you. But that's the way it is. First time there, I think it was 12 or 13 years ago, I was preaching there, me and Doug, for Brother Lyons, Bishop Lyon Welch. And when we was there, I asked him, I said, where is the men's room? He said, you need to use the men's room? I said, Yes. He looks at two men. He says, hey, Bishop Miller needs the men's room. Well, I've I never been escorted to the bathroom since I was a little bitty boy. But they came up, and they walked right beside me. You know, took me all the way there. I thought, well, this is embarrassing. But I thought, sure, they'd be gone. I come back out, they'd stand there waiting. That would be more embarrassing. So they waited, took me back. He told these two guys, he said, He's with you, don't you? He needs anything, you do it. He wants anything, you do it. Anything. And I mean, brother, they're right there. You turn around, you will bump into one. Amen. Am I right, brother? Children, it's right. They're there. Because they, they, they believe in that. They stick close to the man of God. They are there, brother. Amen. They come up. You want mints? Uh, that don't matter. They put them there. You want water? Or you want orange juice? Or you want pop or Coke? I said, man. I think that'd be almost a sin to have orange juice or have Coke up there while you're preaching. He said, whatever you want. I said, well, if you're going to do something, bring water. So they brought that. I mean, it's just like that. They're right there. But you know what? Now, I use that to say this. That's how you ought to be with your pastor, really. 
everything he needs, everything he asks, wherever he's at, instead of fighting everything they do, why don't you back everything they do? Amen. Instead of trying to find a fault with him or his family, why don't you try to find good things in their life? I know you can. Instead of quarreling about what he preached last Sunday, find a good point in his sermon last week and tell everybody about that. Woo! Amen, Brother Miller. Preaching right. Amen. That's the way I believe it ought to be. But let me, let me hurry. Let me hurry. He said... But we see Jesus, and I ask you today, how many can see Jesus? Are you coming in here looking at all the things we need, all the things should be done, could be done? Look, I could come in here, and I, I could, I've already pointed out about five preachers that I thought I know could preach circles around me. I know they can. I'm not stupid. I know they're great preachers. You might say, why in the world? Well, look, if God chooses that, you know what you ought to do? Say hallelujah till he gets done and then back your feller when he gets up. Somebody holler amen. You want to really get me aggravated at my church when everybody else gets up singing and you act like you don't care one bit and then when your singer gets up you go to squalling and screaming. I have such a problem with that. I have such a problem with that. I just do. I can't help it. Hallelujah. But if we could just see Jesus, if we just look at him. He said, we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That's the only reason. Crowned with honor and with glory and honor by the grace of God. They should taste death forever, forever man. It became him um, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory and make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. He goes on and on and on. Not ashamed to call us brethren saying, I will declare the name of the Lord among the brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praises unto him. That's what we ought to do when we come to church. Us too, sing praises to God. Amen. That's what we ought to do when we're here. Amen. In the midst of the church, be rejoicing and be glad and be thrilled and be happy. I was gone this past weekend and I, I, I'd done a slight scolding of our church. I said the last couple of meetings I preached, I said, a lot of you haven't showed up. I know every one of you ain't here because they tell on you. And I said, you don't seem to try. I said, I hope when I leave this week, I get good reports. Hey, Sunday morning, I got about six or seven phone calls. They said, man, I've never heard Jairus preach that good in my life. So he preached great. I said, man, that's good. Sunday night, I let a young boy who's never took care of the church for 25, good preacher boy, I said, you take care of the service and then have Brother Josh preach. I got a call Sunday night, and they said, man, we had the biggest crowd we've had in several weeks and said there was about seven or eight people running. Two or three of them was laid out in the floor shouting. They were speaking in tongues, dancing all over the house. Said, Brother Miller, it's the best service we've had in two months. You know, it didn't make me mad. I was thrilled, Brother Roberts. I was excited when I heard it. They just tell how good it was. Tuesday night, I called up. I was excited. Sunday morning, Sunday night it was so good. I said, how'd it go last night? They said, we come back down to earth. Wouldn't hire nobody here. Dead is 4 o'clock. Oh, that broke my heart right there. Let me go. Hallelujah. He said, I'll put my trust in him. If you see Jesus, you can put your trust in him. He said, and he goes on talking. Well, I'm talking too much in that. But I know this, if we could just see Jesus, if we could just see him. And I have about four or five more, but I'm not going to get to them. I will, get the, I will tell you a little bit about the last one, though. I'll skip them other ones and go to this one. I'm not smart enough as these other guys, you know. Uh, I've preached long enough. I've been preaching 48 years. 40, 45 and a half years I've been full time. Uh, 39 and a half years I've pastored. 30, almost 37, the same church. So, But I don't, I'm not that smart on, on Revelation. But I do know this part in chapter 1. I know this, that when on the Isle of Patmos, I know when he was there on the Lord's day, he got in the Spirit. And wouldn't it be great if we could get in the Spirit on this day? It may not be, it may not be the Lord's day or Sunday, but every day is the Lord's day. If we could just get in the Spirit. He heard those voices, and we know what he heard. And when he got in the Spirit, though, he said he heard him saying, I'm Alpha, Omega, the first and the last. And then he said these words. Now, what you see, 
And I'm talking about uh, how do you see it. And you should have, blessed be your eyes if you can see it the right way. Amen. And he goes on to what you see, you write this down. They said, I turn to see. I turn to look. Aren't you blessed? Sometimes you, if you can't see it just right, why don't you turn around? Come on, turn around. Somebody told me, said, I, I would like to preach holiness, but I can't because it rubbed my people the wrong way. I said, tell you folks, turn around. Rub them the right way. Praise God. They turn around. He said, I turned to see who it was that spake to me. And then he said, I saw. He turned and he looked and then he saw. Today, if I don't get anything else said this morning, amen, no matter, if you haven't been seeing the things I mentioned, like tithing or back in your church and all the other things, you probably do anyway. It's elementary. But if you haven't, turn around. Take another look. Look at it differently. Are holding the standards, you can't see them, and you're still fighting and rebelling and wanting to live like the world. I don't understand why folks want to live like the world and go to holiness church. I think I do, though. They enjoy, they know what the real anointing is. They know what the real power of God is, so they want in on that. They just don't want to live good. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Turn around. Amen. You can't stand that kind of preacher. Turn around. You might see things a little bit different if you'll just turn around. You might see it a little better, a little different. And he did. And when he heard, he heard his voice when he turned. Well, when he turned, he saw. He saw his head, his hair was like wool. You know the story. White as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. All that. Feet burned like brass in a furnace. You know that. Heard his voice like many waters. All of those things. But then he said, when I saw him, I felt his feet as dead. And I want to say this. If you really could get a glimpse of Jesus... I don't think folks would be fussing and fighting and feuding over the Scripture if they really seen Jesus. I don't. If you really got a glimpse of Jesus, there'd be no fussing. There'd be no confusion. There'd be no, they wouldn't. Praise God. I told this, I'm going to tell this again quickly here. Uh, I remember when I first took our church, I, like I said, been there a long time. And when I first went there, the guy that probably fellowshiped me more all through my ministry than any one person was Brother Collins. He was my closest confidant. He was my biggest and closest fellowship and my closest friend. And I loved him and still do. But I remember I was pastoring a little church in the country. And we had a good church, but I felt like God spoke to me to go here. He called me on the phone. And some of you have heard me tell this before. But he said, Dave, what are you thinking? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you don't need to go there. I said, why? He said, and I quote, he said, that church has been ostracized from anything that remotely resembles holiness. And my only answer was, I didn't, I, I didn't know what the word meant. I said, well, what does ostracized mean? He said, cut off, just about like that. And I said, oh. He said, you ain't going to do no good. They ain't never going to straighten up. I said, brother, I feel like God sent me. And there was quiet on the phone. He said, do you really feel like that? I said, I know it. I know God told me to go. I believe God's going to help us. And I remember. He said, well, if you really feel that way, then I'll back you. Four months later, brother Charles, I had, had him come preach for me. I know it was almost right to the day, close to the day of four months. He walked up the pulpit with a guitar around his neck like classic LL. He started picking around, strumming around, just looking at everybody. He looked at him, you know, just looked for, for, it seemed like five minutes, probably wasn't over a minute. He looked at him, he said, well, he said, I told Dave not to come down here and fool you guys. Didn't think there's no hope for you. He said, so help me, I believe y'all going to make it. I believe you're going to make it. And boy, he just, then he bragged on us, preached real good and shouted. And folks, nobody shouted with him because they didn't like him. He's mad at him. They're mad as far. One of them told me, he said, if you ever have that guy back, I'll never come back. He said, let me tell you something, David Miller. He said, we're a good church before we ever heard of you. We're a good church before we ever heard your name, before you ever got here. And, and we didn't like him saying that tonight. I didn't fuss with him. I just smiled at him, went on. Amen. My, let me tell you about my first, uh, can I tell my first Sunday school teacher? First Sunday I went, I'll never forget this, Brother Kevin, first Sunday, uh, Brother Melvin Long, I love Brother Melvin Long, I do. Uh, he, he's he's going to be with the Lord now, but he was a good guy. 
But he came up to me and he said, you want to be the adult Sunday school teacher? It's your first Sunday. I said, no, brother, you go ahead. I want him to teach. He said, well, you might all think about it. I said, why? He said, well, we're going to talk about the first 15 or 16 verses, 1 Corinthians 11. I said, I think I'll take it. And uh, so I did. And on that day, who was teaching our uh, our teen Sunday school class. Now, you won't see none of this now. You just left there. I guarantee you. You tell them, brother. No, sir, buddy. I'll, 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 put, I'll put physically, visibly up against anybody. But anyhow, he, anyway, this uh, lady come up to me, and she said, I understand you don't want me teaching the young people's class. I said, dear God, you the Sunday school teacher? She looked like she went into a cosmetic store and fell over and every, everything and hit her right there. Just terrible looking. Staggered in the jewelry store and that all fell and latched on to her. It looked really bad. And I said, oh, you are? She said, yeah. She said, but I'll tell you if you're going to preach like that, I quit. I said, okay. That's my first Sunday. Boy, what a first Sunday. Boy, it was great. I said, okay. So I looked over at Thelma Cornette, which was Brother Doug's mom. They always believed in holding us living. I said, Sister Thelma, can you go teach that class? Yeah. I said, get back there fast. Get back there. Teach that class. <laughs> so anyway, she did. That lady come in and said, what are you doing in my class? She said, well, Brother Miller said, you quit. So she ran out and come up and said, somebody's teaching my class. I said, I thought you quit. Well, I was just mad. I said, well, you said you quit. I accept your resignation. Hope you come back tonight. She didn't. I don't think she'd ever come back. But anyway, all I'm trying to say is, is how you look at it. I looked Springdale Road as like, that's a good church. And 30, almost seven years later, it's a great church. Hallelujah. Have we had struggles? Yeah. Have we had to preach some things? Yeah. Amen. But God has blessed us. Oh, Lord, I know I'm long-winded today. I'm so sorry, folks. I'm so sorry for being long-winded. But I don't apologize for a word I said. I'll tell you how I see the thing. I, I see the Bible just like it says it. Amen. I'm not trying to find a way around nothing. I'm not. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try one thing to say. I think I could skimp here, or I think I could get around that. I'm going to say yes, Lord. And if He showed me something today, after all these years, I'm willing to move up. I'm willing to do that. How about you today? Amen. How do you see the rest of this service? Well, now if we can, uh, Brother Charles, preach about 40 minutes, we can go over and eat. Hurry up and hear Brother Kevin and I, and thank God this week will be over and we can rest tomorrow. I, I think we ought to see it like this. Thank God. One more day of Brother Charles. Thank God. One more night service. One more Holy Ghost outpouring. Thank God for the rest of this meeting. That ought to be our outlook. Amen. Praise Would you stand and raise your hands and give him a praise this morning? Thank God. Hallelujah.